Hi, I'm Susan Regan, and welcome back to my Strengthening Relationship Talks. This talk is about keeping intimacy alive for people in long-term relationships or just people in relationships. I'm Susan Regan, and I'm a relationship expert and coach, and I'm also a seasoned couple therapist and a certified mediator in the Bay Area. So today I have Namita Kane with me, and she's a sex coach, and she's going to be talking a little bit about intimacy and sexuality in couple relationships. So I, welcome, welcome. I'm so happy that you're here. And could you introduce yourself and tell us what you do and why you do it and what got you interested in this topic and this area? Sure. So um, hi, I'm Dr. Namita Kane, and I'm a clinical sexologist and a sex intimacy and relationship coach. And I work with couples and individuals to support them in creating healthy, intimate um, relationships and a satisfying sex life according to their unique needs and desires. Um, and I got into this work because I myself started out um, feeling very insecure and uninformed about my own body and about sexuality. And I noticed that the topic of sex was so difficult to talk about. I'm originally from England, which is a country that's not known for being comfortable talking about sexuality. Right. And um, I've noticed that the same is, it, 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 there's a similar feeling here in the US. Um, it's difficult to talk about sex. Um, sex seems to come with all kinds of stigma and taboo. And so I was drawn to wanting to demystify some of that. And I started out as a life coach and then quickly realized that the area I was particularly interested in was relationships and sexuality. And so that's what led me there. I ended up going to school and earning a doctorate in human sexuality and taking a lot of classes on various different aspects of sexuality, including Tantra and coaching and really coming at that topic from various different angles from the academic to the more somatic. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's exactly why I had you on the call today on the talk is that I know a lot of my clients um, that I might make suggestions or we're working in couple therapy and we can't get to every single topic and intimacy seems to be one of the places where they're really struggling. It's so important to have other resources for couples. So I wonder, um, I know that I need to give people a sense of comfort when they're trying a new resource. So how do you make people feel comfortable or how do people start with you um, just in the first call? Like how do you get people in? What could you say to help people feel more comfortable in even making that call to go to a sex coach um, so that they feel like, you know, it's something that's just a normal part of being in a couple relationship is working on aspects that you need to develop more skills in. Um, well, people usually find me um, through mostly two different ways. Either they find me on their own online, they're doing some research and they find me, they've typed in sex coach or they've typed in sex therapy and they are being proactive about trying to do their own research online. Another way that couples find me is directly through their therapist. So a lot of couples that I see have worked with a couples therapist and sometimes for quite a long time. And the topic of intimacy and sexuality hasn't really been approached in a way that has made a significant change when it comes to sexuality. Mm -hmm. They often will say that, you know, they, they're communicating better and different parts of the relationship are, um, are doing really well and that they've gotten a lot out of the therapy, mm -hmm. but that sex is not something that has been talked about very much. And so they then find themselves being referred to me, and that's what I specialize in. So it's always easier to talk to a professional who has no problem talking about the subject of sexuality. And how do you get your clients to talk about sex with you, with each other? That's a good question. So the fact that they're coming to me knowing that this is what I do, this mm -hmm. is what I do every day um, with many couples just like them. I think right there, there is just the knowledge that that's why they signed up to work with me. So in that way, they're expecting me to be comfortable 
to talk about sexuality. And I have tried very hard to create a safe space in order for that conversation to be able to happen. So even though folks are often nervous and shy and maybe feeling a little embarrassed when they come in or when they call me, once they start um, talking to me and once they see that I've normalized the topic, that I'm validating the topic for them and that it's something that I can talk about easily, that mm -hmm. helps them to feel more relaxed and to open up. And of course, depending on the client, that will take more or less time. But generally speaking, I find that even after one session, folks will tell me that there's a sense of relief, that mm -hmm. they're finally talking about this topic that's been the elephant in the room for a long time, it's been unaddressed, and now in their own way, at their own pace, they can begin to talk about it. Yeah, great. And so if you were seeing a, tip, a client or a typical couple, what would be the the, the typical reasons why they would come in? Like what are, just to demystify it even further, what are people going to sex coaches about? Um, there are a number of different reasons. Uh, probably one of the most common, if we're talking about couples, is the sexless or the low relationship marriage. So a, re a relationship or a marriage in which there's either been very low frequency of sex for quite a while or no sex at all. And that could be for months or for years. Mm -hmm. That's probably the number one call that I get from couples. Um, libido, one or both partners saying that they have low libido or that their libido is different from their partner's libido. So we will talk about mismatched desire. Mm -hmm. um, sexual interests being different. One person is more interested in certain sexual activities or has different sexual interests than the other, and they're not quite sure how to re reconcile that or to bridge the differences. Um, trauma, sexual trauma is, of course, unfortunately, very common. And so that will show up in the bedroom. Um, sometimes one or both partners have experienced sexual trauma, and that's going to affect the way in which they're able to relate to each other sexually and the comfort level that they need to have in order to be even interested in having sex with their partner. And then we've got sexual dysfunction. This will be more common with men um, in my practice. Um, PE and ED Premature ejaculation, delayed ejaculation, these are two things that men will often be challenged by. And that's something that I get a lot of calls about. That can impact an individual's sexuality and it can also impact um, the ease and the comfort level in the relationship when it comes to sexuality. So in, in the... Um in the uh, coaching format, do you meet with both partners together or is there sometimes that you're really working with one partner just on a topic that they're struggling with? Um, how does that go, your unit of treatment? Yeah, that's a great question, Susan. And I usually start out seeing the couple separately first for one session. So mm -hmm. when I first begin working with a couple, I really want to hear each person's side of the story. Everyone is going to have a unique way in which they view the situation. Everyone's got their own take on what they think is happening or not happening. And I do find that sometimes clients will filter what they say when, when their partner is in the room. So in order to try and get the full story and to build a little bit of rapport with each person, I see them individually first mm -hmm. and then they will come in together. And then based on what comes out of that first couple session, we can see, would it be helpful for me to see one or both people on their own for a few more sessions? Sometimes we sort of spot them. We'll have a couple, a few couple sessions and then maybe an individual session, but it doesn't have to be that way. And there are couples that I see together for every single session. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're, you're trying to help people feel comfortable with what they're bringing to you. As a professional, you talk about this all the time, so it's very easy to talk to you about sexual matters and to help you help people develop sexual language um, with each other and with you. And then you also are assessing, like, what is the issue and how can I help them individually, together, 
getting them to grow in themselves, maybe with their understanding of what's going on for them, and then maybe grow in their communication and comfort with each other. That's, that's sort of the plan as you go in to working with a couple in intimacy. Mm -hmm. Then what happens if, and do you see that there's resistance, like that people's resistance might come up in certain ways, like they only go so far, or they only want to talk about so much, or they don't practice a lot of um, trying to work on their sexual intimacy outside the sessions. What kind of resistance do you see with couples mostly? Um, well, I do see resistance, um, absolutely. And the very, the very first piece is just talking about it. So sometimes the partner is resistant even being in my office. So mm -hmm. there are partners who have definitely come because their partner has insisted on it or their partner um, is threatening to leave the relationship, um, um, is saying that they, they can't continue this way. So sometimes people are there and it wasn't necessarily their choice to be there. So that's the first piece of resistance that I've uh, encountered. And then being able to discuss sex in an open way once, once the couple is there. Sometimes there's information that the couple doesn't necessarily want to be shared openly in that space. Mm -hmm. And they might censor some of the things they say and, and some of the things that have happened that have led them to feeling the way they do. Mm -hmm. So we need to create an, inc an incredibly safe space and that no one's obligated to say something that they don't want to say. Uh -huh. So we need to, you know, folks need to be at ease. And so in order to do that, we're going to, I'm going to create a safe space in order to start the discussion where you can talk about whatever you want to talk about and not talk about whatever you don't want to talk about with regard to sexuality. Mm -hmm. Because people are not com a complete open book a lot of the times when it comes to sexuality. And so we need to do this in a titrated way in order to start to make this a more comfortable topic and a topic that gets talked about on a more frequent basis. Mm -hmm. um, you right. also, yeah, you, you, you also spoke, spoke, Susan, about home play. So I call it home play rather than homework to try to encourage couples um, to think of this as something that's helpful, that's supportive, that um, deepens what's happening in the office in the therapy session. And you're right, some people will do the home play diligently and in between sessions ask for more home play. Um, and then other couples find it very difficult to do any of the exercises. And that often speaks to having a schedule or a life that's so busy that they find it hard to include anything else, not just sex. It's hard for them to do anything. It's hard for them to have leisure time. It's hard for them to have a date night that doesn't have to include sex. It's hard for them to ever go away for just a, a night um, mm -hmm. and have the kids be with the babysitter. So we need to look at the whole picture of what's happening in these people's lives in order to be able to address the sexual component. Right, so I, I also know just because I think when I um, refer a couple to having some sex coaching, because again, not everything can be handled in the one hour of therapy a week in a couple's therapy session and then they get to bring that information back in and integrate it with the other maybe dynamics that feel really similar that they struggle with like who's the initiator and who's the person that is the diligent homework person i mean those dynamics show up in all different ways in all different parts of the relationship but there's a particular stigma right to having a sexual issue because we're, we don't, you know, where do we learn about how to have a healthy sexual relationship? And where do we learn to talk about sex? And where do we learn to be open about sex? There's not many places that we get taught these kinds of things. And I, I always think about when I talk about um, couples gaining new skills, it's like, these are, these are developmentals that you can develop. And so, I think about the stigma of just talking about sex in general and why people might come to you. And then I wonder is, is there this normal sexual, healthy sexual relationship? Do you have a normal um, definition? Is there a normal definition or is there more of a what's unique to the partnership definition? 
Uh, well, that's a great question. That's a great question. And I, and I try to steer away from that word normal uh, a lot. Um, um, they're, they're, there's only what's normal for that couple. And so okay. there is no generalized normal that people need to aspire to or compare themselves to or wonder if that's what other people are doing and that's what they should be doing too. The only thing that matters is what's going to be possible for this couple. Mm -hmm. And since we have two unique individuals and a unique relationship, there's no value in comparing to what anyone else is doing. So what's healthy for a sexual relationship is what's healthy for that couple. And that's going to begin with them needing to learn about each other sexually and learn about themselves sexually. Oftentimes couples are thinking that they need to go through the different emotions that many and most people go through. Uh, which we might describe as linear sex, the linear model of sex. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't make any allowances for who they are personally and what their personal interests may be, what their frequency. Some people like to have sex more than others do. Some people like to have sex in different ways than other people do. Some people are more kinky. Some people are more into tantra. Some people are more into quickies. There's so many different ways that a couple might want to have sex with each other. And so I, I believe that having communication in sex is a healthy sexual aspect mm -hmm. of a relationship. Being able to communicate and to share with each other, what are my needs? Mm -hmm. What are your needs? And how can we make space for including both of our needs? Perhaps not all of the time, but some of the time. So that right. So maybe the stigma is created by what is normal. And I, I always think what is normal is that people might need help figuring out how to talk about this, explore this area with each other and get to another place where they don't feel so much pressure or stress around um, sexual engagements. You know what I mean? That, that, that's the um, breaking out of stigma and breaking out of normal is just figuring out how to develop themselves in the arena of sexual intimacy with each other now however that looks like being free enough to to do that absolutely i completely agree this idea of normal um or is it some sort of version of what people believe is normal and it's probably one of the most common questions i get i get phone calls all the time from people asking me if what they're into is normal or the amount of sex they're having with their partner or not having is that normal? Am I normal? And it becomes this very shameful and burdensome question that's simply unhelpful and doesn't take into account the fact that we're all individuals and that there really is no normal. Right. Right. So I wonder if you could describe a typical somatic sexual practice that you do with couples, maybe even just um, to get them to relax with you or to relax with each other. Absolutely. So, so my work is, is somatic and it's experiential. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by that is that I am going to do my best to make my session more than simply talking to clients. That is something that in the past I have found isn't as helpful as being able to introduce some very simple, basic somatic practices in my office, mm -hmm. which help to give clients an understanding of what it is that I'm talking about. So I'm not just giving them a description of an exercise that I'd like them to do at home, which typically doesn't happen. Right. So having a precedent in the office is helpful. And what that might look like is um, first of all, being able to relax and calm and minimize the mental chatter that goes on in most people's heads as they evaluate sex, as they wonder, am I doing it right? Does my partner like what I'm doing? There are so many unhelpful chattering thoughts that happen in the background. So one of the first parts of my job is to just help people drop into their bodies and to decrease that mental chatter and to be able to feel. So they're overthinking. A lot of the time, everyone's overthinking things too much. They have a, a, a dialogue or a monologue happening up in their brains, and they're not able to feel. And so the exercises are designed to help clients feel, 
to help clients to attune to each other, to relax, to connect, then to be able to learn different ways of touching each other that may be new. Of mm -hmm. course, what happens in the office is fully clothed and non-sexual, but the clients can then take those same practices home and learn to deepen them and make them more intimate. And I track progress as we go. So we're always building. One session is building on the next. And that amount of building is going to depend on the progress of the clients themselves. Mm -hmm. So to demystify that, the idea of a somatic sexual practice being introduced in your office, what would that, what would that look like? Like, give me a, the, like a starting one that you would do with couples. Um, I might have couples uh, sit across from each other and just begin to drop in and reconnect with what it is that they appreciate about each other. So a lot of the times couples are coming in and they're thinking about all the problems they have and all the ways in which they feel disconnected. So the very first thing I want to do is to start to help uh, cu couples reconnect, help, fo help, help folks reconnect with each other. And that might include breathing together. It may include eye gazing. It will certainly include an aspect of uh, a short meditation that I will take them through in order to help them transition mm -hmm. from whatever happened before they came to see me, which mm -hmm. is usually driving, focusing on traffic, worrying about a work project, picking up the kids, who knows what, to then being right. in, in this space that's more body oriented. So mm -hmm. I am going to begin by teaching people how to transition from the busy doer, from the daytime person, the productive person, the cognitively oriented person into a more somatic body oriented person mm -hmm. who's able to make that transition, which is incredibly hard for some people and easier for others. Again, right. and, and I love that. I love that the two things that you said is like coming into your office, working on the concept of minimizing chatter. I wrote these things down, minimizing chatter um, and minimizing the unhelpful thoughts so that they can tune in and cue in to their own selves first, of course, and then their partners instead of like, am I doing it right? Do they like this? Um, uh, or I'm not feeling like I like this and I really don't want to talk about it. Um, so tuning in and relaxing and connecting instead of being in the judgment mind where you might just not be present at all in the judgment mind. And then I think the, the, this is such a critical thought is the, the transitioning because we're all in our heads all day long, even like getting to somebody's office or thinking about what we're going to do after that. Can we really be there and be with each other, which is definitely, I think, one of the reasons. And tell me if you think this is true is why couples stop having sex is because they're too busy to drop in and then with themselves, let alone finding time to drop in with each other. It just feels like another maybe thing on the list or um, another thing that they could criticize themselves or their partners about. Um, so those are such good points. The, the, just the own, your own mental chatter enough to be present and then transitioning so that you both can be present together, whatever that takes individually to do or together to do as a couple. Absolutely. And, um, you know, different folks take different amounts of time. So it's important for each partner, if we're talking about couples specifically here, for each partner to learn to recognize that their partner might not transition in the same way they do. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that some folks transition quickly. Um, I'll just give you an example of, for example, uh, a male or female client who feels like they can be in work mode and then they can be in sex mode. It's not a big deal for them. They feel horny a lot of the time and they're ready to go at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. And then they have a partner who's just not wired that way. And their partner cannot just be folding laundry or taking care of the kids or coming back from her job and suddenly going into lover space. Or it could be, it's not gender based. It could be the other way around as well. Right, right, exactly. So, it's important to know how we transition, but also very important to know how our partner transitions mm -hmm. and what they need in order to be present to a sexual encounter, to a romantic encounter um, um, w within, within the sexual space. Because wouldn't that be such a different conversation 
to be able to have with a part your partner is to say, you know, oh, I see you're having a hard time transitioning or I see you're caught up in your head or I'm caught up in my head and I'm having a hard time transitioning. So that instead of it feeling like rejection, 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 instead of it feeling like rejection, it feels like, okay, I can be connected to you in whatever's going on with you. I hear a lot of, of times my um, couples are talking about they just don't want to initiate sex one more time because they're so tired of being rejected. Mm -hmm. But if the conversation could be, um, so are you here? Are, are, is something going on in your mind? Are you needing to talk about that first? Or um, should we reschedule this? <laughs> should we go and do the dishes first if that's going to help you? Um, do you want to check on the kids? Is that what you're thinking about? Like something like that. It would be such a different connection and it would be sort of both parties working on how can we make this this connection work instead of how do we work how are we working against each other or feeling like we're projecting all this stuff onto the other person right so there's there's such a that's such a nice um example and i and i love that i want to underline that um mm -hmm. for the people that are listening to this like so much about what's going on in your own head so much about what it takes for you to transition and and so much about you understanding that part of your partner as well. So it's like the both sides of it. Um, you talked earlier about this linear model and could you describe that a little bit more and what model would you say you're working in um, when you are doing sex coaching with folks? Sure. So the linear model is sort of the normative model. It's what we see in sexy movies. It's what we see in porn. It's what we often believe um, the steps towards having sex might be. So it's a scripted formula and it can work well, particularly in the beginning of relationship. And after a while, it doesn't tend to work as well. The reason that it doesn't work as well, because it's, it does not make any room for things not going according to plan. The linear model is a step-by-step -step progression um, whereby we build up from a look or a touch all the way to having intercourse, if that's possible, um, with or without an orgasm for one or both people. Mm -hmm. And so it's very scripted. I believe it to be unforgiving. It doesn't make room for things to go um, to go differently, for mm -hmm. things to not go according to plan. And so it's very rigid. And therefore, what often happens is if things don't go according to plan, we just stop, give up. We don't find ways to adapt to what's possible in the moment. So an alternative to the linear model is the circular model. Mm -hmm. the circular model is a model in which we can do all the activities that lie on the, on the linear model and more in and out of any order with and without orgasm, with and without an erection. Because orgasms and erections have become a little bit of a gold standard for what we think sex needs to look like. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. There's a lot of pleasurable, satisfying sexual connection available to couples with and without orgasm with and without an erection and if right. we can start to if we can start to think about sex in a more circular way it gives us spaciousness and a little bit of breathing room for things not having to go according to plan that's great because i also think it's it, it set the linear model sets up whether you succeed or fail the circular model is there's no failing. There's just connection and intimacy and exploring and communicating and, you know, being able to be present together. So it's a completely different um, subset of goals there. Absolutely. To, to Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and perhaps the linear model is the goal oriented model mm -hmm. and the circular model doesn't have goals. It I just, see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just has possibilities. Mm -hmm. And the very notion of goals is one that we often talk about in sex. How helpful is it to have um, specific goals in sex? Does it make us feel like we're putting ourselves back on that script again? These are my goals. And does it make for sex that's more about the destination than about the journey? Right, so, so in the circular model, 
the word goals is replaced for experiences, mm -hmm. right? Well, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I wonder if you see success with your couples that you work with of how can you turn a no sex or a low sex marriage and how can you into a sexual marriage that feels easy and non-pressuring um is it possible for people who haven't had sex for periods of time for sometimes many good reasons like there's a death in the family or tragedy or a, a, a surgery and then um there is a, a change of maybe heart like you just never get back there again or there's an affair or a, a, a series of negative arguments or things that have happened that people have a hard time getting over um, so i know there's all sorts of valid reasons why people don't reconnect at the same level where they feel satisfied or they feel like the relationship's working for them but when you when you really look at this is it is it possible and how have you seen this play out in your practice uh, it's absolutely possible. Um, it does require willingness. So there is, um, you know, there, there's an aspect of wanting this to happen, but not sure how. And if we can start from a place of openness and willingness to be able to see what is available to this couple now, I hear a lot of couples say, you know, it was so great in the beginning and we want to get back to that. Or, you know, we had so much passion in the beginning, we couldn't take our hands off each other. And people, mm -hmm. there's this sort of cliche of wanting to rekindle the spark and um, or, or to be able to find that place that we lost as if it was lost and now we needed to go back to it. And I think it's more important to acknowledge where we are now what our needs are now, what our interests are now, and to, in a way, create a whole new chapter. Instead of kind of grieving the loss of what, you're, what, you're, what you want to get back to. Exactly. Creating a new way of, getting, of, of being together. Exactly. And, I, and I, I feel with couples, there's a sense of relief then. I'm not having to be who I was. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I don't look like who I was. I don't have the same amount of energy that mm -hmm. I had back then. And mm -hmm. I also don't have um, a cocktail of hormones coursing through my body, which I had during the honeymoon phase. Right. But that, that cocktail, we drank that cocktail a long time ago. And so now that we've had that cocktail, let's see what's possible now. Mm -hmm. And let's take a look at what our interests might be now. And if we can see our partner with fresh eyes in that way, who are you to me now? Who are you to yourself now? What matters to you now when it mm -hmm. comes to touch and pleasure and sexuality? And if you don't know that, let me help you to discover it. There are a lot of people who've been going through the motions of sex for a very long time, doing what they think they're supposed to do, um, because that's what normal people do, um, or trying to please their partner. And so they actually never really found out what it is that turns them on, what it mm -hmm. is that makes them feel pleasure, what it is that they enjoy. And so for some people, it's not only a new chapter, it's a whole new beginning because they've never really had the kind of pleasure that their body's capable of experiencing. I see. So that question is so important is like, who are you now? And um, who, uh, who, let's see, how did you say that? Who are you now and who are you to yourself now? Mm -hmm. And just exploring that, because maybe that was never explored. It was like you just kind of played this role or played this position or went into the last part of the relationship that it wasn't really a conscious thing. It wasn't really like checking in with yourself thing. And that maybe in this later chapter in your life, as in this relationship, you're going to be discovering yourself almost for the first time or yourself in the body you have now or yourself as like a new identity. Maybe you're like a, a different career or a, a parent or um, maybe you're in your second marriage, like you're a different person, a different identity than you were. Absolutely. And we've grown, we've changed, we've evolved, we've, we've aged, mm -hmm. we've matured, we've gained wisdom. Um, and so being able to take all those components 
into account as we rediscover what mm -hmm. it is that we would like at this stage of life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes somebody is going to have gone through an illness. Um, so there may be physical changes. Um, there may be all kinds of changes that affect what the possibilities are now. And right. so it's, it's being realistic and also just working with what's possible and who we are today. But also really opening that up to your partner so they cue into that. So it's not like I think sometimes with um, sexual intimacy, people just like the, being in the chatter brain is like people keep all that stuff that they feel so insecure about or self-conscious about to themselves. And, you know, I hear clients a lot tell me like they're, they're thinking so loudly, like maybe they have body images and all of the things that we talked about that could be get in the way of being intimate. And that's all they think about, right? And so it's almost the same thing is opening up to who are you in this new chapter and can you tell your partner who you are and can they tell you who they are um, so that you don't have to keep that to yourself and just go back into the linear cycle. Like the linear cycle might be the safe model of relationship with sexual intimacy because you kind of know what to do. And in the circular cycle, you don't know what to do. Or the circular model, you don't know what to do. It's being really present and figuring it out together and communicating about it, so. Absolutely, and, and I think that if people can start to just recognize the difference between these two models, um, there's going to be so much more space in the circular model than in the linear model. And even though people know what to do in the linear model, if things don't go according to plan, then they don't know what to do. In the circular, right, right. right? so yeah, they tried everything in the linear model and it didn't work, so they feel like they failed, exactly. or they're not interested in it. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And there's an expectation that sex should go a certain way, right? And and so we're expanding our definition of sex. We're expanding mm -hmm. the menu. We're expanding just the definition and the lexicon of what sex means to us by adopting a model that's more inclusive, that has more variety, more spaciousness, and more possibility. Mm -hmm. So in, in summary, this is the kind of the summary question is, um, what do you feel like is the most important thing for couples to consider to keep their intimacy alive? Like to consider, to do, uh, to be proactive about, what would you say? The well, the first, five things. The top, well, just off the top of my head, um, um, well, communication is key. Um, mm -hmm. Communication's at the foundation. It's the bedrock of relationship, whether we're talking about sexuality or we're talking about other aspects of the relationship. So being able to communicate um, is, is primary and being able to open up that conversation about sex. Making time to connect as a couple. Mm -hmm. Whether you're having sex or not, making time to be intimate, making time to um, share quality time together. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean because you're making a date to be together that you have to have sex, but there might be an intention to connect together intimately in some way. Whether you're reading a book together about sensuality and pleasure, or you're giving each other a foot massage, but you're doing something that um, is not sharing popcorn, watching Netflix. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Which has become a lot of the way couples spend time together now because they're so tired and the schedule is so busy that at least they're sitting together on the couch next to each other. But right. And maybe it's also that our, our, our couple's minds, like all of our minds are so overstimulated with social media. So there's always that, there's another world that we're living in where you get down into this very somatic um, feeling each other's body, having someone else feel your body, even if someone's like brushing your hair or, um, you know, helping you um, massage your shoulders or something, just something that helps you get into your body, which isn't, you know, watching something on the TV, right? It's really like attending to each other's energies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and then connecting with your own desire. So we've talked a lot about how do couples keep this alive, but if you don't keep it alive within yourself, it's going to be difficult to keep that alive with your partner. If you're mm -hmm. not connected to your own sense of desire, to your own body, 
to your own sense of pleasure and sensuality, it's going to be difficult to share that with another person, especially if it's been dormant for a long time. Right. So you need to connect with yourself as well. And then um, being, um, being tactile, being physical with each other in ways that keep the connection alive. Um, when not necessarily in the bedroom, but in all other aspects, do you hold hands? Do you take time to check in with each other? Do you have time where you're touching each other in a non-sexual way on a regular basis? All of these things are going to activate oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone. And we need, we need oxytocin activated on a regular basis in order to stay connected with each other and to feel that sense of love and bonding and connection. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the whole idea about staying connected with yourself, like if there's been a break in intimacy and sexual behaviors or connection between a couple, that it's that I think often what happens is the other partner feels so much pressure to find that for the person that they're with. And so you really need to come doing your own exploration and work on yourself. Like you need to be connected enough with your own sexual desire. Um, and what ways could couples do that? How could they find a way to connect with their own sexual desire? How could they find a way? Well, first of all, being mindful of the body. So we're back to that chatter. Mm -hmm. We're back to the idea that we're busy, busy, busy on the go, go, go. And mm -hmm. we're not necessarily dropping in. Is that person doing any practices that pertain to the body? Uh, am I doing yoga? Um, do I self-pleasure? Do I enjoy it? What does pleasure look like to me? Mm -hmm. Do I have a practice of self-pleasure? Do I enjoy what water feels like when I'm taking, the sh taking a shower? What's my connection to my body? Do I feel a sense of desire? Mm -hmm. Do I connect with a sense of libido? Do I, do I know what my libido is? Am I connected to my libido? And if not, what practices might I be able to create for myself that help me connect with that? So for some folks, it may be dancing. For some folks, it's getting regular massage. A manicure and a pedicure can be a way of connecting with a sense of physical touch. Um, so many people are so touch deprived now that there is no touch in their lives and mm -hmm. there's not touch towards themselves either. Mm -hmm. And there's an expectation sometimes that, um, well, there's so little time, whatever time I have, I'm going to reserve that for being sexual with my partner, but I'm not actually connected to my body. And if I'm not connected to my body, it's going to be difficult to elicit that connection with a partner. Right. So, so, so the motto is kind of connect with yourself, know how to connect with yourself so you can connect with your beloved or the person that you're, is your partner or your intimate partner. But you have to be able to connect with yourself and evolve that first, um, or at least be in, in a parallel process of evolving it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. We need to be taking the two aspects into consideration. And I think that's also the real, a really important piece is the self care is like, if we're living hugely um, busy lives and we're never replenishing ourselves, we don't have anything to give ourselves. We're not going to have anything to give. So to do those small practices like, yoga, massage, running, taking in a sauna, getting a pedicure, those small things can make a, a huge difference. Getting your hair cut, <laughs> you know, I know I see a lot of guys at the barber, you know, they, they, they do that as a regular uh, practice, you know, it's just a way to connect and, you know, have some kind of conversation with somebody about yourself and focus on yourself. Those small things are huge things when it comes to, you know, some of all of, some of your own needs can't be put on your other partner to figure out what it is that you need. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Self-care, um, self-care, having a self-care routine that includes sexual health. Mm -hmm. so well, I love this. I love this, the conversation, your experience just comes right through. You have such an ease in talking. 
um, about this subject. And I think that's, that's so key because I think you're, you know, I, I can imagine, and I know with my clients that there's so much anxiety talking about this subject that it's avoided. It's, I, I think people talk about um, money first in my sessions before they talk about sex, like sex is just not approached. Um, so I love this idea about like getting the help that you need. And, and there was also something that we talked about, which is that you can do longer sessions with people that you sometimes you do these weekend retreats and with people being so busy and going once a week and that might cause more stress to just like fit in that session. Can you talk about those weekend retreats that you do with couples? Absolutely. So I sometimes work with couples and do an intensive and I might see a couple for um, several hours during the course of a weekend. So possibly a few hours on Friday evening and then some time on Saturday and Sunday. There's no set requirement for the number of days or hours. Um, mm -hmm. And we figure that out ahead of time. So oftentimes those retreats will be preceded with a Skype call. So we can drop in and we can really tailor and create a retreat that is going to be addressing what that particular couple specifically needs. And so I have a number of people who prefer to do it this way. It's easier for them and, and they, they, they feel like they're getting a concentrated amount of attention on the topic that they can then take away and practice at home. Got it. Yeah, I think that's also you know, an amazing way to spend time and a lux luxurious way to spend time with your partner um, to really drop in deeply with them over a period of time and hone into the places that are difficult to drop into. Um, and having you as, as, as the guide. So I really appreciated your, um, our conversation today. It just feels like you're, you're so expertise in your field and that you would be the kind of person that people could talk about this very sensitive issue with. Um, I hope that you'll give us some information about how to reach you. I know that we'll attach a link to how to get in touch with you, but is there any other thing that you're doing that people could join or do you have like a newsletter or um, a YouTube channel or whatever else people do these days to get people information? Sure, absolutely. Well, I have a website, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Um, I also have uh, sex and intimacy coaching.com. And if somebody wanted to join my mailing list, I send out tips and advice on uh, different sexual topics on a regular basis. And I also mm -hmm. offer clients a 15 minute complimentary phone chat. So anybody who's interested in working with me and wants to know more or who has questions is welcome to reach out to me and we can set up a complimentary phone chat if they'd like to do so. Great. And as far as I am concerned, I have a newsletter that you can sign up for too. And these talks are the precursor to a four week 30 day challenge for couples to really take a look at their relationship and see what areas they want to get more help in and develop some resources so that you can strengthen your relationship because there's no reason why your relationship can't be stronger and that you can't feel more loved and connected to your partner. So thank you so much for being on the call. I hope you got some helpful tips today and bye for now.